to the launch of the latest season of Emory University's Health Storytelling Project, a Q&A series with authors of fascinating new books about health and science. I'm Maren McKenna. I'm a journalist and author and senior fellow in the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University, and I'm the curator and host of this series. In a moment, I'll introduce you to my guest, science writer and editor Quinn Eastman, and his fascinating brand new book from Columbia University Press, The Woman Who Couldn't Wake Up, Hypersomnia and the Science of Sleepiness. But first, let me tell you about this series. At least once per month during the academic year, we invite writers whose journalistic or academic books examine health, the science and history of health, and health's intersection with society. This series of conversations originates at the Emory Center for the Study of Human Health, and the entire year of productions is co-sponsored by the Georgia Center for the Book, an affiliate of the Library of Congress, and Science Gallery Atlanta, which presents exhibits that live at the juncture of science and art and ignite creativity and discovery. And this year, for the first time, we are joined by a new co-sponsor, whom I am absolutely thrilled to announce, the Decatur Book Festival, the largest independent book festival in the United States. Book fans may know that the Decatur Book Festival is taking a post-pandemic hiatus to rethink its goals and strategies. And in that pause, we are delighted to bring these authors in our series to the festival's passionate supporters. So let me tell you who will be appearing. Our theme this semester is how patients identify illnesses that medicine initially does not recognize and how patient communities are forced to become their own advocates and persuade researchers to collaborate with them. Tonight, as I mentioned, I'll be talking to Quinn Eastman, a biochemist and science editor and journalist and author of The Woman Who Couldn't Wake Up. On October 5th, I'll be in conversation with Jennifer London, an essayist and cultural critic who lives in Maine, whose new book, American Breakdown, Our Ailing Nation, My Body's Revolt, and the 19th Century Woman Who Brought Me Back to Life, interweaves London's experience of mysterious fatigue with the story of the brilliant, witty, 19th century diarist, Alice James, who spent much of her adulthood bedridden. And then on November 2nd, I'll talk to Amy Doxer Marcus, a Wall Street Journal reporter and Pulitzer Prize winner, whose book, We the Scientists, how a daring team of patients and doctors forged a new path for medicine. That book explores how a group of parents whose children had been diagnosed with a rare and fatal genetic condition, transformed themselves into citizen scientists to reach for a cure and save their children's lives. So this series, it's live streamed on YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and X, formerly Twitter, and archived on YouTube, where you can find all of our past seasons. And one note about that, if you are watching us on September 7th, you are experiencing a live event. You can interact with us and we encourage you to do that. If you're watching on YouTube or Facebook, your comments will come through to our live stream platform. We apologize that this integration doesn't work for Twitter anymore. Twitter broke that. But you're welcome to post your comments and tag our account. If you comment, our producer Stefan Kaplan of Spin It Social will make sure we see what you've said and we'll put your questions up on screen when I pose it to our guest. Do note that I'll turn to your questions in the second half of this 60 minute live stream, but you can put your questions in at any time. Now, let's turn to our book and guest. Quinn Eastman is a biochemist with a PhD from Yale. He is a science editor and a journalist who's covered a wide variety of topics. And he is now the journalistic expert on idiopathic hypersomnia, which we're going to talk about. Quinn, welcome to our storytelling series. Thanks, Mary. So 
I have so many questions. It's such a good book. Thank you so much. Um, the, the first, of course, uh, as always, is just uh, tell our audience a bit about yourself. Tell us how this book came about and how you came to the topic. Ooh, um, so um, I am kind of a, a biochemist by training a long time ago, but then, um, you know, my postdoc hit a wall right? and then uh, um, so I uh, kind of re decided to rechar uh, you know redirect and and um, head into journalism and I was a newspaper reporter for a while and since 2007 I was a biomedical science writer at Emory and um, this story about um, Anna the titular woman who couldn't wake up was started even before I got to Emory um, and um, and I actually owe uh, my friend Carol Clark uh, the kind of she got the basics uh, when one of the people involved gave a lecture about Anna's case uh, in 2007. But then, so this was kind of floating around for a long time, and I and I uh, eventually went to a lecture given by uh, David Rye, who's kind of one of the main characters in the book, and got to know Anna and Rye and a lot of the other players. And um, so, and then explaining how Anna's story fits into the larger story of uh, the di the diagnosis of idiopathic hypersomnia. That's, that's the challenge, right? Um, and so that's kind of what the whole book is about, is about where this, there's this, category of sleep disorder di diagnosis called idiopathic hypersomnia. It's been around since the 1970s. Um, but until about a decade ago, uh, there wasn't really much of a community as far as like, you know, support groups and, and or organize, you know, organize advocacy organizations that could speak up for these folks. And uh, even among physicians, it didn't really get that much respect. So that's a great place to jump in. Uh, and I want to talk about all of these characters. Um, but a thing I wanted to say to start that I think is so fascinating about this book is that I think it's fair to say that Americans, at least, are kind of obsessed with sleep. And I have to say, I am coming to this conversation a little sleep deprived myself. It's close to the beginning of my semester. Um, my car and my water heater both blew up today and it's been a little busy. And so when I went and looked up some of the links related to your book so that we could tell the audience about them later, I noticed that there are so many books about sleep. There are books about how to sleep better and how to sleep more and how to sleep less, but in a more optimized way and how to get your child to sleep and probably an infinite number of books about how to persuade babies to sleep. We are so um, passionate about sleep or as a culture that we even have a national sleep week, which if I remember from when I was a newspaper reporter, I think is sponsored by mattress manufacturers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so sleep is obviously something that we all want to know more about. And we probably mostly feel like we don't get enough sleep. And here you have a character, multiple characters, who actually have the opposite problem, that they can't stop sleeping, whether or not the sleep is good for them. So how did you, did, I mean, did you feel that fascination when, when you entered into this? this oh, thing? yeah. It, well, but it was more like it was this insidious thing where you, um, where it's kind of sleep is taking over more and more of their lives. You know, if, if, you know, if a, a, a child uh, is supposed, is supposed to go to bed earlier, you know, they, um, if a child is uh, sleeping 10 or 11 hours a night, that's great. Right. It's good for their parents. They have something else to do. Uh, but if an adult is sleeping 12, uh, 11 or, you know, 11 or 12 hours a day i mean actually sleeping not i mean there's the whole i there's the whole different thing about people who spend a lot of time in bed because you know they don't have the motivation to get out of bed or it just hurts too, too much or whatever 
These are people who are actually asleep 11, 12 hours a day. Um, and they are they feel sleepy even when they're out and about uh, doing they uh, trying to do stuff. They, um, I mean, I remember meeting, carefully meeting, uh, arranging a meeting with someone who uh, felt uncomfortable driving for more than about 20 minutes, right? Uh, and then, and then thinking about how, how that would limit uh, anyone's life. And then um, they, they experienced this thing. Uh, some people experience a symptom called sleep drunkenness, such that it's sort of this half awake state that lasts a, a long time after you wake up. So it, it's, it's, it's like sleep just seeps into every part of life and kind of takes it over. So the, the thing that struck me a moment ago when you were talking about how you first discovered this story is that this was not a very well conditioned, well understood or well recognized condition. And I think any of us who have been around healthcare for a while can remember other conditions that, that that's the case for, that, were, that emerged, that were not well known, that in many cases, people had to convince medicine that their condition actually existed, uh, Lyme disease at the start. Um, myalgic encephalitis, chronic fatigue syndrome, most recently, long COVID. And so I'm imagining that since you were around at the start of the recognition of this condition by the research establishment with that, that first uh, announcement in 2007 and then the first paper in, I think you said, 2012, um, you witness, you must have witnessed this some sort of confrontation between people who were convinced that they were seriously ill and a, a medical established that, establishment that maybe wasn't quite ready to receive that news. Well, it's it's a little more gradual than that because um, idiopathic hypersomnia as a diagnosis was always kind of obscured by something else, narcolepsy, that was better established. That you know there were FDA, FDA you know for decades, or at least a couple decades there were FDA approved medications for for the uh, for the indication. There were support groups. There were you know it was it's been known since the 19th century, and what um, what idiopathic hypersomnia has been is sort of the shadowy sibling that is not is not as well known and and, and the mo the sleep medicine field it was more oriented towards narcolepsy and so a lot there were lots of people who for example um told their families or told or told the insurance company <laughs> that they were they had narcolepsy because it was easier for them to get a med, uh, their, the medications that they needed. Even if they were not exactly the right medications? Um, whether they were, that's that. Uh, what, it helped them, it allowed them to get through the day uh, for a while. Um, but, but you were making that comparison about uh, uh, chronic Lyme and and my uh, ME CFS. The I think it's a good comparison to make, but I think sleep medicine always recognized there was this thing called uh, idiopathic hypersomnia, but it was never a full. It, it until recently it was not a full thing. It was just kind of this like the leftover bin, um, and, and then. Uh, over the last decade, that situation has changed. And we're going to talk about that, uh, that evolution. But I just want to remind people who are watching us, I can see there are lots of you. Thank you for tuning in uh, to this live stream. If you are on um, Facebook or YouTube, possibly also on LinkedIn, you can comment and we will see those comments. If you're watching us on Twitter, you can comment in the uh, by tagging our account, and we will be searching for all these comments. If questions are occurring to you, you can pose those questions now. I won't pose them to Quinn until we're a little bit further into this hour, but 
don't forget what, what the thing is that you want to ask. Write it down now and I will see it. So Quinn, I'm really interested to hear about some of the characters in this story because you begin with the woman who, who who's the subject of that first paper, but then, then a community coalesces around this condition and, and then other members of that community actually sort of carried the torch forward. And that's yeah. a really interesting, um, a, a really interesting narrative to me that it's not a single crusading patient, but a group kind of holding each other up. Yeah, that um, it, that was a bit harder to sell as far as like, you know, a book proposal or whatever, but uh, but it's really more illustrative of it really takes a community of people to band together and and say we have something that is not well uh, recognized and get and demand more attention for it. Um, and that's that's what I'm hoping is one of the key messages for people who have chronic illnesses that they don't that is that you might feel alone if you you know your doctor doesn't take you seriously your insurance company doesn't take you seriously but if you have a thousand or ten thousand allies then they will take you seriously so one of the aspects of taking you seriously i would think is that you become visible to to biomedical research and potentially you become sort of a, a imagined as a possible market if uh, if drugs can be achieved and there is a point in this story in which researchers come researchers of course have been involved with individual patients for a while because there is that seminal paper that brings attention to this uh, but but as the community collects there's more interest and particular researchers who, who sort of rise out of this interest and really become strong characters in your book. So talk about them. Um, well, the, the early uh, few chapters are driven by action at Emory, uh, which is, you know, we have Anna, uh, the, 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 the woman who couldn't wake up, right? And, um, she had a, a an experience which they th which was thought to be kind of exceptional that she responded well to this oddball drug that the doctors tried and um when that it turned out to be good for some other people not everybody but at least some of the some people with these hard to treat sleep disorders then the light bulb went off for the for the uh, for the doctors, and they said, "Hey, maybe there's some there's something here." And that uh, the the problem was that the the drug that she uh, that Anna responded well to was already out there. It was patented and uh, kind of it, it was old. It was called it's called flumazenil. Uh, it's an antidote for benzodiazepines. It's kind of um, hmm. If you are if you're sedated with anything from you know like you go to the dentist or uh, getting another medical procedure, uh, what flumazenil does is that it wipes the sedative away. Uh, and but if you just give it to somebody who's already not doesn't have drugs in their system, it's not supposed to really do anything. And what was uh, kind of remarkable was that. Anna responded very well to this thing, and it made the doctors think there's something in her system that is like a benzodiazepine. Hmm. Um, and then they, you know, they tr they they tried this with other folks. They found uh, uh, biochemical signs that there was something in uh, patients' uh, spinal fluid. And then they went. They went on this. There's the, starts this whole detective story about what is this stuff, and that 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 is never resolved, uh, at least in the, in the in within the within the book itself, um, and it still hasn't been resolved. Um, but what what it sa says it, what it what it shows is just that this drug was different from a kind of a conventional stimulant, which is what is what. Uh, people with these 
with hypersomnia type disorders were generally prescribed. Um, they it helped they could get through the day, maybe, but after a while it would stop working. It made them depending on. Um, who you're talking to, it would make them too jittery or, uh, you know, I mean, I remember talking with someone who said that, you know, she couldn't, she couldn't even eat uh, something because her hand was so uh, shaking so much from taking so much Adderall to just to stay awake. Um, so it's, it was an alternative to conventional stimulants. And I think they, the field still needs uh, alternatives to, uh, to conventional stimulants, and th those are coming. Um, and that's a, that's another broader theme that I think that the people, like that the Emory people recognized and they tried to follow. Um, they later um, started hooked up with a company that was trying to do, that was testing a, 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 a similar, a drug that worked in a similar mechanism, but was... Um, and uh, and that 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 kind of meeting of the minds that drove the first clinical trial for uh, that included people with idiopathic hypersomnia, and that's another thing that I hope that the book will do is to kind of mark that that company which didn't make it uh, was later dissolved um, was the first one in the space. Because right now, what's happening is now that there's uh, now there's this other strange drug that works by a different mechanism that was approved in 2021 for idiopathic hypersomnia. It was the first. Um, but what happens is drug uh, companies um, can they put they can buy ads on the internet and they can um, kind of define. Uh, what people see as far as when they go looking for what you know what is this strange thing that the doctor told me that i have um that they can define it so uh, what i'm hoping is that um this will kind of provide the backstory that is is independent of that so as these drugs were worked on um we talked a little bit about anna but there must have been other patients for whom these worked well or badly. And I think you definitely met some of them. So are there other patient stories that you can tell us about how people, as they moved through this experience of forming a, a patient community, um, how, how they discovered that their experiences of being treated for this were not all the same? Um, so Anna was the first person to be treated kind of chronically with Flumazno for a sleep disorder. And she was like the only one for a few years. But eventually, David Rye, who neurologist at Emory, um, main character in the book, um, kind of got worn down by uh, the patients who wanted alternatives. And uh, he said he was just tired of kind of posing a bleak picture to them and and saying um you know there's nothing else you can try uh so you know he, he started prescribing uh this off you know basically off label um and then but it was available he was it was available through a compounding pharmacy which is sort of this gray area that you can get a um since it's approved kind of as an antidote, you can, you know, a pharmacy can get it. They can um, make it into these little lozenges that people take or a skin cream, actually. Uh, and then people could take it that way. And then there, there was this kind of underground movement <laughs> of, of people taking flumazenil for sleep disorders. Um, and it kind of, and it was driven partly by social media. Huh, tell us more about that. Um, there, and then there, there was this fellow in Australia, uh, Lloyd Johnson, who started a website uh, called Living with Hypersomnia. It's not uh, active anymore. 
but the the kind of the hypersomnia community kind of uh gravitated to this and then there was a facebook group and and other things like you know people started uh starting new groups and can and kind of i mean there was always there was always stuff for people with narcolepsy you know since before social media um but then they kind of um crept in around the edges and then said, hey, we should start our own thing. And then they started talking to, to each other about, uh, uh, about these alternatives. And um, that was kind of one of the main venues for this, this community to come together, coming together first online and then later in person. Uh, I know as a journalist and also for on behalf of family members, I've spent time in particularly Facebook groups that have been put together by people who suffer from chronic illnesses of various kinds and who talk back and forth about my symptoms are this. Does anyone else experience that? I've tried this as a treatment. Has anybody else heard of this? There, I saw something you know, out there on social media that sounds like it might be promising. Do you think this is fake? And those 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 kind of exchanges are incredibly powerful and really empowering for people who have something that's not otherwise, either not otherwise recognized or not well-defined. Um, and so did you spend time um, in those groups? I know you said you went to the very first conference that was ever organized yeah. for idiopathic hypersomnia. And so you must have had a real immersion uh, in these patient communities. Well, um, I was a lurker for a long time. And I also kind of, I never kind of mixed it up with people because I didn't want to kind of, kind of throw my weight around as a you know, a, a representative of Emory or, or something, because that would be just, just seemed inappropriate. Um, and also like, I have sleep apnea. Hmm. <laughs> I experience kind of a mild version of what uh, people with uh, hypersomnia uh, experience in the sense, what I tell them is, um, I see what you experience through the key, through a keyhole. And, um, so I could certainly relate to what they're they're experiencing, but it's not the same. Um, and so I was lurking for a long time because I was kind of um, I don't know. I one of the researchers was uh, was also a member of the one one of the face group, Facebook groups, and I thought, well, if he's a member, then I can be a, I can be a member too. So I, I would see it all the time, but I didn't really get. Um, I also, you have to be really careful about, you know, not kind of jump, you know, kind of ambushing people ba based on what they say on uh, social media, because, you know, they, they expect it to be kind of a protected space, right? So um, I think, I think what I would use uh, fa the Facebook group as being kind of as an issue spotter, like I was, if I would see a lot of people complaining about something or then um then i would see say okay that's an issue uh but i would um always kind of approach people kind of uh you know one-on-one -on -one to say hey i'm working on this can 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 we um meet can we uh, talk about it some more um and how did they react when you did that? I'm assuming you DM'd them, you emailed oh, them. Oh yeah, yeah. And oh. did were they were they offended that you'd been lurking, or did they feel like this was a chance to tell talk about their experience that no one else outside this community would understand? Um, well, the other thing I had some help <laughs> that because um, I had um, at that point built up uh, a good relationship with people like Diana Kimmel. Who was the organizer of the first of the Atlanta uh, hypersomnia support group, and um, and then some like it is very it's varied. You know, some people are happy. You know that you know you want to tell a story about something that that um, is not well recognized. That's great. You know, uh, you know I don't think you're being exploitative or anything. That's just go ahead. Um, but other people, you know, they want to tell their own story and that's okay. 
Tell us a bit more about Diana Kimmel, because I think if I remember the book correctly, even though uh, the book begins with Anna, Diana Kimmel becomes more of a face of this disorder as the narrative goes on, right? She's comfortable in the spotlight. She she well, has a, a good experience. Um, only recently did Diana kind of become a board member for the Hypersomnia Foundation. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, um, you know, if you organize the support group and you and you organize uh, snooze cruises and the, all the things that Diana does, then eventually, yeah, you're kind of comfortable with be this being the, you know, the focus of your. Okay, you know, we need to hear more about snooze cruises. I have not been on one, uh, I, uh, but that's the idea is that it's on a cruise ship. And then um, if people with hypersomnia want to get together and go on a cruise together and and talk about uh, the issues that they face, then that's a good setting because um, you can always take a nap when you need to. I'm going to remind the audience again, thank you all for listening. We can see all, all these listener numbers on our dashboard, and it's very exciting to know that you're here with us. So thank you. If you have questions about what Quinn is talking about, about his book, The Woman Who Couldn't Wake Up, uh, about the condition of idiopathic hypersomnia, um, about the experience of being of encountering a new patient community and watching that emerge, please put your your um, your question in the comments. Uh, you can't come on camera. I'm going to relay your question to Quinn, but we'll put it up there on on the screen so everyone can see it while we talk about it. So Quinn, a couple of times you've mentioned a researcher, um, David Rye, and it feels like he is really important to this story. He is someone who really takes this seriously and takes it takes the condition on as something he's going to devote research time and attention to. I would love to hear more about him. I, I'm hoping that the book conveys just what a char what kind of a character he he is. Um, he's um, still, he's still seeing patients at Emory, although I understand he's not a full-time uh, clinician at, at, at this point. Um, what, I mean, I think Rye was part, is shaped partly just because he was a kind of a maverick character, but also because he had this experience that his, what he was into before hypersomnia was uh, restless leg syndrome, and that also, uh, was was not fully taken seriously. I, I mean, you can remember kind of people making jokes about it, saying, "Is this real?" Um, and so he was comfortable with that. The thing that he was interested every, in, every, you know, lots of other people thought was bogus. So uh, he was down with that. So he he began prescribing to to members of this community. The, that first drug, that existing old drug that was being used off-label. But mm -hmm. then does he become part of the research effort to find a new drug? You said there was a clinical trial. Yeah. Um, he, he, yes. Um, I mean, there were, some, there were some issues where, you know, because of, they were trying to commercialize um, there was an issue that, you know, he couldn't, um, he couldn't be the, um, principal investigator for the, for, for a clinical trial. Um, but he had, there were more people involved besides him. Um, they, there was this, they had the detour and I, I don't know whether it is a detour, but, um, but they found that this other drug by chance. Um, Anna had responded well to flumazenil and then she took an antibiotic uh, because she had bronchitis. And, um, and the antibiotic is called clarithromycin. And this made her uh, have insomnia for like, for like she couldn't sleep for three days. Um, so the idea was that if she responded well so strongly to that, then it must, uh, have a weight promoting effect. And so uh, the, the hypersomnia community took up clarithromycin, which was more available because it's an antibiotic. 
you know, you can get it, you know, the doctors can prescribe it easily. An old antibiotic, not something new on the market, right? Yeah. Something that would be generic and relatively inexpensive. Yeah, and then the clinicians, all you know, one of them, uh, like uh, Dr. Trotty, uh, all, um, always expresses kind of misgivings about this, saying, you know, I look forward to the day when I never have to pres prescribe chlor chlorithromycin again uh, because of concerns about uh, antibiotic resistance, which you know a lot about. Um, and then just, but it was kind of self-limiting also because um, chlorithromycin gives lots of people a bad taste in their mouth. Uh, it makes them, they, they say it's like um, having uh, metallic objects in your mouth all day. Hmm. So we had this original drug, yeah. this old drug that was used, and then people adopt this old antibiotic, but we still haven't gotten to the point in the story where there's a clinical trial for what is presumably uh, something new, right? So where does that come from? Um, the clinical trial uh, was from a company called Balance Therapeutics, and mm -hmm. Balance had start, was started at Stanford and they uh, were investigating a drug called pentaline tetrazole. And that has a weird history all by itself. Um, in the 1930s, people, um, psychiatrists gave it to people with schizophrenia in huge doses to trigger seizures. Hmm. And, but then if, if you take it in a kind of by mouth, then it doesn't cause a seizure in a smaller dose anyway. Um, uh, what Balance was doing, uh, was originally looking for was uh, a medication for uh, people with Down syndrome uh, to uh, basically as a cognitive enhancer. And it works uh, by a similar mechanism in that it, it um, inhibits signals from GABA in the nervous system. So GABA is sort of the, the one of the main inhibitory uh, neurotransmitters. And um, if you inhibit the in inhibitor, then it's activating. So I think our audience is probably going to need a little more explanation about what a neurotransmitter is and what in inhibition okay. is. Um, so uh, when you fall asleep, there's a certain part of your brain in the uh, called it's part of the hypothalamus that is sending out signals to other parts of the brain. And those are inhibitory and it's through a neurotransmitter called GABA. So it's shutting your brain down. Yeah, it's sort of telling other parts of the brain, calm down. And um, the idea was, is that if in someone with hypersomnia, that this these signals are too active. So the idea is to turn is to kind of turn those down a bit. And the clinical it, trial. And the, the clinical trial for there were two clinical trials sponsored by Balance. Um, and the results were never released. There are people um, who I know uh, who have very like Diana Kimmel, uh, who had po uh, positive experiences with penicillin tetrazole. They said it was great. Lots of other things didn't work for them. But in terms of, you know, if it was a great success for more, for enough people, we would have heard about it because uh, the company would have said, would have, uh, you know, brought it to the FDA. They would have um, asked for approval. So, um, it's, it's kind of one of those mysteries of science, why something, why some people respond well to this drug and other people don't. So this is a really interesting story to tell. That's one of the things that, that I found so fascinating about it is that in, in, in several different ways, the, the, the narrative structures that we expect for a story about medicine for instance, the detective story, right? That something has happened and some brave investigator is going to figure it out and they follow all the clues and they figure it out and we have an answer. Um, or or the, the kind of the, the 
brave and somewhat wacky investigator, right, who has an idea that nobody else believes, but they fight through all their experiments and they prove that it's true. Neither of those really happen in this story, well, right? You have an, a detective yeah. story that doesn't get resolved and you have a clinical trial that feels like it ought to be the big hope for people and it doesn't end up quite white like people want that those are two profound narrative challenges for a writer <laughs> yeah um and to be clear i didn't know what the result what when i started working on on this project i didn't know what the result of the clinical trials would be um and it was only because there, there was this other medication that kind of swooped in out of left field um, and it succeeded that kind of made the the, the story have this natural ending mm -hmm. and that fine now uh the what i what i would like to compare it to uh although i don't know if some of the people involved wouldn't like the comparison is that uh, in the 50s and 60s, uh, there was a group of people who uh, there was this multivitamin theory for schizophrenia. Hmm. The idea that um, that people with schizophrenia have a vitamin deficiency, and if you give them a lot more vitamins, then they'll they'll improve. Um, but at that that um, and there was this um, so. This came along at the height of uh, Freudian influence in American psychiatry. Hmm. So that's when um, you had this idea that the, it's, it was the parents who make their kids uh, um, have schizophrenia. It was the mothers, right? Mothers right. were blamed for this, <laughs> yes. Which, you know, the families didn't like that. So um, you had these people like uh, um, Osmond, and Hoffer, and they had this theory that there was a kind of a metabolite of um, norepinephrine uh, called adenochrome, and it was a hallucinogen, and it was there was too much of it in the brains of people with schizophrenia. It was sort of the, the the theory that they have in 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 my book is about the sleepy stuff, and that's the, a very technical term, right? The sleepy stuff. <laughs> And the theory that they had about schizophrenia back in the 50s and 60s was the hallucinogenic stuff. And this didn't, that theory didn't work out, but it was this biological alternative that um, was attractive to families, like people who were, you know, the parents of people with schizophrenia said, you know, I, this is, I don't want the, they're tired of having the, the doctors blame them, you know, so they organize the, the, there's a group, the National Alliance for the Mental Illness, NAMI, I don't know the exact acronym, and they kind of, and those families gravitated to that and they, and they built up this, um, and they, they built the community. So the scientific theory didn't work out but it built the community that's that's the parallel if you can does that make sense mm -hmm. yeah it does so but but i have to track back to something you said a minute ago because we were talking about the clinical trial and how um it apparently didn't work since the trial was never reported out and the drug was never brought to the fda for potential approval there is no new drug for this but you said that something swooped in so what's the thing that swoops in um there um this is a medication essentially that was approved for narcolepsy about 20 years ago. Um, there, it's uh, formally called uh, Oxibate, um, which is kind of a highly regulated version of uh, GHB, gamma hydroxybutyrate, which is this fast acting sedative and there are thousands of people with narcolepsy who take this every night and it helps their bodies get good sleep and they feel better the, and more awake uh, during the day. Um, it's not really, it's still, despite lots and lots of research, I mean, this thing was first identified in the 50s um, kind of as a, as a drug. Um, 
it's not really clear how this thing works. Like how, why, even when it's kind of washed out of the body, why does it help someone stay awake the next day? Um, so this was approved about 20 years ago for narcolepsy. And then the company called, uh, now called Jazz Pharmaceuticals that um, manufactures it, um, they developed a low sodium version. <laughs> and um, they, when their primary goal was to, I think, to, to get it approved for narcolepsy, but then kind of along the way, they said, okay, well, let's, let's do it for idiopathic hypersomnia too. And at that point, um, the patient groups were organized. The uh, sleep medicine specialists were more uh, attuned to the need for an alternative for, for an alternative for an FDA recognized medication. So it came through. Because it was, it already had uh, an established history, a clinical history. People had been taking it, if not for the same yeah. condition. So there were, there was stuff to lean on. It was not starting from nowhere. Yeah, in in, in a sense, um, I think of it as being the, the commercial name called Zyrem, and now it's called Zywave. Um, the there's a group of clinic. Uh, Physicians around the country that can pre that prescribe uh, Zyrem and Zywave, and it's very highly regulated. But there was, you know, they were all used to it. So the idea of prescribing it to another group of patients that they had been seeing already, and some of them had been, you know, uh, prescribing it off label, um, that that fit. Uh, it, it wasn't too much of a stretch. So this is a perfect time to ask some of the questions that have been coming in um, from our various platforms. Lexi Campbell asks, how do scientists decide uh, to, to treat something with an existing medication? What are, what's the trade-off between um, a potential therapeutic effects, but maybe it being not such a perfect match? Did you talk to the researchers about that? Um, it, for for this case, it was kind of trying everything. Um, that in the book we see that um, Anna tries conventional stimulants, modafinil. Um, her doctor offers her um, drugs for people with Alzheimer's. Uh, you know, and then this was sort of a last resort. It's like. <laughs> We tried everything else. Let's just try. Let's try this. There's, you know, doc, physicians will try. Just, you know, the more adventurous, adventurous ones will try it. I mean, if depending on the perceived risk. So it's 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 often about make. Uh, if something does work, then making a making a rationale <laughs> after the fact. But what are the, so this is another question that's coming from the audience. What are the ethical dimensions of that? Um, it's always about weighing potential side effects. Like um, for Anna, I tried, at the, there was this drama at the beginning where um, flumazenil was thought to put someone at risk of a, uh, having a seizure. Um, and then that didn't happen. And I'm, we're, we're very glad that that um, didn't happen. Um, and then all, even today, like um, with um, Zyrem and Zywave, I think they have safety issues um, and the physicians who uh, prescribe it are, are aware, aware of them and, and want to make sure that the patients are safe. So, I, I think several people who are watching want to know kind of how Anna's story ends. What is her, what's her status? What, oh, what's um, her condition now? Well, Anna um, is a successful lawyer <laughs> in, in Atlanta. Um, she, uh, she's married, she has a, a son. Um, I have not met her son, but I remember seeing a, a video of him running around. Um, she, 
as far as I know, still takes flamazinol. Um, and so she she's kind of the success story, but she never really like she didn't want to become kind of the the voice of the community. She, mm -hmm. she was happy to kind of participate in the initial round of publicity, but others took it further. So there are a lot of characters in this story and particularly because there's not one single person to carry forth the narrative. Um, we have another question um, from Nolan Shaw, who asks, how do you balance telling patient stories while also giving the underlying science its due? And let's face it, neuroscience is kind of gnarly science for the average person. I mean, I just had to make you explain what a neurotransmitter is. I don't think I, so I, how, did, how did you balance this? I don't think I did adequately. Um, it's a matter of um, not giving too many de details at once. Uh, not, um, you know, explain at the beginning of this, I didn't know all, all the different parts of the, of the, of the brain and I still don't, um, you know, it's, it's just piece by piece. Um, I don't still, I still don't consider myself a neuroscientist, even though I know the names of a few parts of the brain. Um, I can recite the, uh, the, the mnemonic for the, the main, uh, nerves. That's about it. Um, you were, but you were, you trained as a biochemist. So did that make a difference? That, that you oh, were a yeah. scientist first I, before you were a journalist? It especially came in handy um, understanding um, uh, narcolepsy, uh, which is is caused by an overreaction of the immune system. And so my graduate training was about uh, how the immune system develops and all the different molecular parts. Uh, so, yeah, <laughs> that's a good... <laughs> Um, that's, I feel like that, that prepared me excellently to explain, uh, where narcolepsy comes from. So we're coming close to the end of our hour. Um, and this is the point where I ask people sort of the big overarching questions. What did you learn writing this book? Uh, immersing yourself in these communities, watching a clinical trial unfold, um, watching the recognition of this condition expand um, and be taken seriously? What what things did you come away with? Um, I think it, one, it, gave, it made me think a lot, you know, a lot about people living with chronic illnesses and the, you know, they, they, what they need and deserve. It's as far, you know, it's, there are, you know, there's dealing with their insurance company, there's dealing with their doctor, but also dealing with family and friends and just have them having them uh, recognize what what you're dealing with every day, what they are dealing with every day and have them see it as real. Um, th that was a lot. Uh, but also in kind of and seeing how those communities develop and how they all the, the dynamics within those communities that I learned a lot about that about um, just how um, just about how scient uh, scientists and physicians work um, you know uh, I think what I really wanted to do was to put idiopathic hypersomnia's story uh, out there so that other people could kind of fit it into the larger picture of these chronic illnesses like that you mentioned um, at the beginning and kind of compare and contrast and and see what what has worked and what hasn't so i'm going to scoop up one more uh, comment from the audience because it's something that i think i agree with which is that that you're what i think you're saying is that your book you hope um, illuminates more than just the community that has dealt with or has researched idiopathic hypersomnia. That it's really, it, it's a narrative of the problem of chronic illness, especially a sort of orphan chronic illness that isn't well understood or recognized, that you're giving people 
the, sort of the average person a sense of what it's like to live inside a condition like that and how challenging it is. I mean, is that right? Are you hoping that people read that and take, read, the, read this and take that away? Yeah. And, and on the other side, these are things that um, the, 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 the disturbing part of this or, or kind of unsettling part is that these medications that that are used to help people stay away always get used by other people? Hmm. Um, like, I mean, that happens with amphetamines. That happened, and um, that happened with modafinil, which was kind of developed 20, 30 years ago for 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 narcolepsy initially, and then got used by lots of other people. And then now there's. Um, a class of drugs that is still it's still experimental uh called either hypocretin or orexin uh agonists so um people with narcolepsy are at least a certain form of it are their brains don't make a certain uh peptide that helps them stay awake and these drugs kind of mimic that or they they try to replace it and so this is something that the narcolepsy community has been interested in a long for interested in for a long time um but everything that gets developed for the, for that purpose always gets used by you know fighter pilots surgeons college students uh, everybody else who wants to stay awake right so um it's. I wonder what happens when some of these actually get make the make it out there. That it that's for still for the future. <laughs> that seems like a good place to stop. Quinn, thank you so much for spending all this time with us, talking to us about the experience of writing this book and immersing yourself in this community and meeting these researchers and following this very complex narrative to, if not to its end, then to the stopping point it's originally at now. I'm so glad you joined us. So that's it for this edition of the Health Storytelling Author Q&A series. Please consider following Quinn on social media. You can see his handle on the screen and buy his book. It's, his publisher is Columbia University Press. It's available on their site. It's available on Amazon, of course. Um, and it's also available at bookshop.org, which is kind of the anti-Amazon. It's a platform that funnels orders to independent bookshops. And if you like going to independent bookshops, actually to the stores, we urge you to follow the link we provide for IndieBound.com. That site will show you which independent bookstore near you is carrying Quinn's book or can order it for you. So this concludes our first episode in this semester's iteration of the Health Storytelling Project. In future months, as I told you, we'll hear from Jennifer London about American Breakdown and Amy Doxer Marcus about We the Scientists. This series is hosted by the Center for the Study of Human Health at Emory University, co-sponsored by the Georgia Center for the Book an affiliate of the Library of Congress, Science Gallery Atlanta, and the Decatur Book Festival. On behalf of all our sponsors and from Emory and from me, thank you for watching. See you next month. <laughs>